Okay. I have some notes. Okay. And you'll... <laughs> okay. Fantastic. Okay. <clears throat> Shall we start? Sure. Yeah. Okay, we're starting, so uh, we have five minutes late, so we're starting right now. Um, let me just briefly introduce the panel. I'm Fabio Chiusi, I'm a journalist for L'Espresso and a fellow of the Nexus Center in Turin. And um, with me is Hossein Direction, a Canadian Iranian uh, blogger and author, and Matthew Ingram for um, Fortune magazine. Uh, and it's quite a good company. <laughs> and um, the panel is how to fight back against big data. And I don't particularly like the, the, the catchphrase big data, you know, because it, it obscures more than it tells and it reveals. And I think <clears throat> we should in technology get rid of such, you know, marketing PR oriented words. I prefer talking about algorithms, which is instead a quite technical and uh, precise uh, term, a set of instructions to do something, you know, in a finite uh, number of passages. Uh, the problem is that when you have a lot of data, of course, nobody would say having more data is bad. Uh, instead, when you're talking of algorithms and the influence you have in, in the lives of people, there are some quite bad consequences of having life driven by algorithms, and that's what we're about to talk. Just a brief uh, talk about, brief, uh, brief introduction on, on the issue for those who are not uh, into this topic. Uh, algorithms have, have given way to a lot of uh, bad uh, instances of behavior. For example, we have automatic decisions that lead to automatic discriminations, which is a growing field of research, and we have a lot of uh, bad consequences in biases in data sets, for example, in code, which are enshrined in code, in, uh, in e-rating systems that influence the way in which you're judged, in which you get credit, for example, in your insurance rates and everything. We have algorithms that claim to be objective, but in fact they're not, and again they hide some political discourse or maybe ideological discourse or motivations that are the ones of those who created the algorithms, which right now most of the times are still human beings <laughs> and not other algorithms, even if it's possible. And algorithms also uh, essentially have no ethics, whereas in fact, again, they embody and they enshrine the ethics of their creators and we totally lack, uh, um, or almost totally lack, a discussion on the ethics of algorithms and this has bad consequences as well. Some algorithms are even non-human rights compliant and uh, I can remember Michael Hayden uh, General Michael Hayden, uh, former director of the CIA at the NSA, say we kill ba people based on metadata. And these metadata most of the times are, are computed by algorithms. So these are very, very uh, important consequences for human beings. And of course, one of the questions I would like to, to, to put out here is how to make uh, algorithms human rights compliant. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, we know a lot of about fake news and things like that, you know, even another catchphrase that I personally hate. But um, again, this is very, a very real problem. Algorithms can go against democracy, against media pluralism, against the th truth or some so-called truth. Algorithms are not transparent. Most of the times we don't know what, why we see what we see on Facebook, why what we see what we see on Google. You know, we, we, we lack precise criteria. We don't really know what's going on there, and that's a problem too. And then, and we can go on forever, but I want to pass on to my uh, co-panelists. And uh, another problem is that we have algorithms against spam, for example, that become algorithms against extremism, and again, they become censorship. So you, you, need, you, start, you start out with something that should be uh, completely straightforward. You don't want spam to, you know, bother you all the time on the internet, and instead you end up with systems of filter, filtering systems, automatic filtering systems for uh, having to do with extremism, propaganda, and that ultimately lead to censorship, which is a kind of a huge problem. Uh, like some days ago, Twitter said that mo more than 250,000 accounts have been suspended by algorithms and filters built to find spam, but employed to combat the specter of violent extremism. This is a serious issue, you know, not just because of what of the propaganda we're exposed to, but uh, also uh, 
for the things that we lose when we censor some kind of contents. So we lack basically everything when we deal with this issue, even, when, even if we start to talk about it quite extensively. And my first question to the panel is, uh, is it possible at all to fight back against all of this? Because algorithms are so pervasive and so everywhere in our lives. They even you know, drive market transactions. They do everything. They're, start, they're about to start uh, driving cars themselves. Everything is, uh, they start to be delivering uh, fruit and vegetables via, via drones. You know, it's going to be crazy. And, and in the internet is going to be into everything with the internet of things. Uh, estimates vary, but of course, we, can, we know that maybe 50 billion objects will be connected by 2025. This is Huawei estimate, I'm going you know, on memory. But they're, they're going to be everywhere. So what to do? Is it the first, and the first question I think that should we, we should be asking in a panel that aims to build a resistance against all this is, is it possible to do it at all? Um, who wants to start? <laughs> it's more experience. <clears throat> I think it's definitely possible. I think it takes a lot of effort on the part of the user to, I think there are two things you can do. One is to be aware, and I think that's sort of the first battle, is to become informed about when algorithms are affecting you, affecting the way you perceive the world, affecting what you're doing. Um, I like to ask uh, civilians, as I call them, people who aren't in the news industry, who aren't in tech, I ask them whether they know that Facebook filters their newsfeed and shows them certain things and doesn't show them other things. And over 50% of the people I ask are unaware of that. So these people wow. don't know that the view that they're getting of the world through Facebook is filtered by an algorithm. And I think the danger there is not so much that Facebook is doing something bad but that their view of the world is being determined in a way for them, and they don't know that. And so uh, I think part of what the media needs to do, part of what people in general need to do, is to educate themselves and others about when algorithms are being used and what that means. I mean, the word algorithm to a lot of people is just Greek. Of course, it is Greek. But anyway, uh, it doesn't mean anything. They don't know what an algorithm is. They don't know how they function. Um, but if you explain fil Facebook only shows you certain things, and it decides what to show you and what not to show you, and it's based on what it knows about you or what it thinks it knows about you, then I think that you know, gives people an idea, at least, of what they're dealing with. And then they can decide, well, I don't care whether Facebook is determining what to show me, and that's fine, that's a choice. But at least it's an informed choice as opposed to something that's imposed on them. And the second thing I think we can do is, and Hossein has a couple of interesting ideas about this, is to, is to effectively try and hack the algorithms that are trying to control you. Uh, and not, I don't mean hack them the way a programmer would, or you're free to do that if you are a programmer, I'm not. Uh, I like to try and confuse algorithms because I'm afraid that they're determining things in a way that I don't like. Uh, I don't have any evidence of that, but I, it's a fear. And so I like to try and uh, do things that are unpredictable. I like to try and uh, randomize the inputs that I use and randomize the, the information that I see. I deliberately uh, juggle, for example, Twitter accounts that I follow and unfollow. Uh, I try to follow accounts that I would not normally follow. I deliberately follow people who believe the opposite of the things I do. Um, I don't want to... I'm trying to keep the filter bubble from becoming as constricting as I think algorithms would like it to be. Um, I don't want to live in that kind of bubble. And so I try to seek out differences and, and the odd or unusual because I'm hoping either that the algorith algorithm will be smart enough to recognize that and show me those things or that I will confuse it and therefore it won't show me as much sort of similar things. Yeah, I, when you said this, I, to my mind, uh, my mind goes to the book uh, published by M MIT Press uh, called Obfuscation by Finn Branton mm -hmm. and Nussbaum. And they say exactly the same, just try to fool the algorithm. You know, they just, they're just not good enough at the moment 
to compute whether you're uh, actually saying the truth when you say that uh, you're a blonde, you know, beautiful girl. <laughs> And I don't usually and, say that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, me neither. But it, it's easily recognizable by a human, you know, but not maybe by not not by algorithm. And so I'm I'm passing on the question, the same question. Do you think is it possible? Because awareness here is very important, and of course, being aware of the basics is a good start. But then again, when you when you go into the, into the details, you know, we had Adam Mosseri here this morning, and. We have a very good presentation from Facebook, but we lack any of the details about mm -hmm. the newsfeed function. We need just we have just broad criteria, you know. So even if we are aware, we don't really know how to hack and exactly hack. Right, thing. and the worst part is it's a black box. <coughs> Facebook will not tell you. Uh, I mean, Google does this as well. They don't disclose how it functions, um, and so you can't. You have to sort of reverse engineer exactly. how it's functioning by seeing what the outputs are, um, and they. They, I think one of the risks is Facebook's response is it's just showing you what you want to see. So the algorithm is just a machine that shows you things that you will like. But that's, that's not what it is at all. No. It's, it's what a group of engineers decided was the, the output that conforms to what they think you like based on certain activity that, that you perform on Facebook. Yeah, it's also telling what you should like, right? <laughs> which is kind of different. Well, what's your take? Um, I would like to start from a theoretical point, which is, um, and I love this idea of Michel Foucault, um, the, the French historian of ideas. He says that where there is power, exactly in that point, there is resistance. Huh. So that gives me an idea of how you can resist against super powerful things. And now that, you've, that we all faced with this dominance of um, algorithms, the personal data that they gather about us, and they're going to be using it against us, not in, in our benefit, definitely, in credit um, records, in insurance matters, in, um, in everything that has something to do with money and banking and these <coughs> things. Um, and predictions, because they all use these to predict us. And once they can predict us, there's no question for them anymore. And they can um, completely control us by, by uh, having access to this information that enables them to predict our behaviors. So um, if you start from this formula, in a way, of resistance, then you would be able to locate these points of resistance. And when I have been thinking about this, you could do two things, basically, when, it, when you're faced with this problem. You can either sit back and refuse to participate in this process, which is the equivalent of going into cave. caves. This is something that you might, def um, you might have heard from Bible. It also exists in the Quran, the story of of, of a few people who, who went to, who escaped from a um, very violent, um, I think, um, pagan uh, king at the time, and they were Christians, they went to a cave and uh, they slept, and once um, they woke up, they realized that hundreds of years has passed, and, um, what, and they, had not, they had not noticed that. They wanted to stay away from things, and they went to this cave. We cannot do that now. Um, I mean, we can, but we would end up like Osama bin Laden at the end, I think. Uh, what we can do is, is easier, I would say, and maybe a bit more creative. We, if we cannot refuse to participate in this, in this process, we can produce too much information, too much untrustworthy uh, information, we can contaminate the data that is being gathered about us by not being completely truthful in our preferences, in our ideas, in our behaviors, in our engagement, basically. So if we randomize for instance, now on social networks. If we manage to randomize our engagement, what we like, what we don't like, what we um, share, what we 
um, send or what actually even what we look at or what search keywords we actually put on Google, um, then we would be able to make, if there is enough people, if there is a small percentage of people doing this, then if you are Google if, or if you are Facebook, then you wouldn't be able to say um, if that specific piece of information is genuine because you know there is a small percentage of contaminated data or untruthful data gathered from some people. And because you cannot spot that, that part of wrong information, then they wouldn't be able to use it the way they would like to. So, and I'm sure, um, I know of some people who are doing some, um, some technical things to, to do this. For instance, um, the, um, there is a plugin written by, I don't remember his name, I saw it on Twitter a few days, uh, last week. Mm, he actually had produced, um, I think, a plugin for a browser plugin that would, will, while, while you're sleeping, it would produce search um, terms and it would search basically random things on behalf of you and then the, um, the data that would be collected about you would be completely randomized based on that. Um, so I think this, this, is a, this is a new approach to this um, algorithm-dominated world, where I think um, very soon we, anyone who has control on algorithms has more power. The future wars probably, the future political wars would be about how, who to control algorithms. They would replace ideologies in many ways, and maybe they have already. Um, so it's very important to have um, some sort of resistance mechanism against these things, because soon, not only us, but e even our devices at home, fridge, television, you know, heaters, air conditioning, they will all be producing a lot of data about us. And we can produce randomized data by any of these devices and by, and by ourselves um, to confuse them and to contaminate them so the big companies cannot trust them and cannot use them against us as citizens. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, I just I'm, was just wondering whether this uh, thing by Foucault, but this fault by Foucault, where is power, there is resistance, still apply in the age of Facebook, you know, because Facebook has spread like wildfire, and actually there there have been no great resistance to any of its moves, you know, um, except for some particular some particular privacy policies. Uh, I'm thinking about, for example, WhatsApp trying to get the the name and contacts from Facebook, whereas they said, you know, for, for, for years they said they, they wouldn't have. And then they, they tried, and then they had to, 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 to backtrack, you know, when, when people started complaining and, and, and only institutions started complaining and threatened to take action against that. But again, it's just the minimum part of the whole, the whole uh, framework, you know, and the whole scenario to me is that, you know, we may be needing some kind, some larger form of resistance, which is questioning the very heart of the of their business model, which is putting efficiency as the ultimate human value. You know, when when you need, when you buy this assumption and that everything must be efficient, and that everything must be you know immediate or um, or non mediated, you know, by, or just mediated by some kind of platform, and because having Uber, for example, take, makes public transportation more efficient, you know, mm -hmm. uh, except there are no mm -hmm. Public, there is no public transportation anymore, uh, or housing, you know, with Airbnb, for example, yeah. or Facebook, you know, makes more efficient connecting to somebody in some other place, you know. But again, this has a lot of bad consequences. So, uh, what I'm not seeing, and I'd, I would like to see, maybe, is more of, together with this kind of, of, of resistance of obfuscation and, and the like, uh, I would like to see some more uh, uh, thought opposition, you know, some kind of intellectual resistance to, to all of this. Because my, my, my perception is that, you know, the, the only ideology where all of us are actually buying is no more neoliberalism, it's Silicon Valley, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and that is, that's, that's scaring me, actually. I don't know if you all agree with that, but... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a little conflicted in a way, because I think 
algorithms do lots of things that are worthwhile. Yeah. I mean, the simple fact of having an algorithm is not bad. Definitely. Uh, the fact that you automated a process that took people a long time and, and a lot of boring uh, drudge work or math or whatever is not inherently bad. Um, it's that the outcome of the the algorithm determines the service. The service shapes the individual to some extent. The individual's behavior is then controlled to some extent by the algorithm. Uh, maybe they're denied health care. Maybe they're uh, treated differently because their behavior suggests something about them. Uh, maybe they're added to a watch list. Those are the things that are bad. So it's, yeah. to me, um, I want to be as aware as possible of the outcomes of the algorithms that are all around me. I don't need to know how they function necessarily, although you know, a bit more information than zero would be nice, but I don't need to know sort of the details. I want to know what, what things are being determined based on that. What am I mm -hmm. being denied? What am I being subjected to? What am I missing? What am I, uh, you know, where am I, what lists am I winding up on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of examples. Oh, oh so there is a question, of course. Of course. So why did we surrender? Why can't I have the algorithm running it on my computer? Why did I, when did we decide it was okay for Facebook to be the only algorithm? Yeah. Mm. I mean, it, we never considered the possibility that we could own the algorithm instead of them. Yeah. We, we could, I think. Hmm. Yeah, um, usually when I speak about this, I put this, um, this technique Thanks, Dave. of resistance. Dave Weiner. Dave yes, Weiner, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the tough He's... questions come from tough people. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. This, this yeah. is only on a, on a personal level, but this is not enough. This kind of resistance definitely is not enough. We need to think about structural ways of resistance, and I think one of them would definitely start from the point that you just mentioned, uh, which is which I would which I call it a social level of resistance, which is raising awareness about the very fact that these algorithms have alternatives. There are many other kinds of algorithms that could actually be functioning on any of these things, and the very fact that they have this monopoly that they can decide what kind of algorithms they, they dominate on your news feeds or on your life. And they, they never disclose what they do and how they do it. This is problematic. So I think if there is enough awareness, a public awareness about the fact that mm, not all kinds of algorithms are bad, but we have to know more about them and we have to be able to choose algorithms because this has been also an idea of allowing third-party algorithms, forcing these companies to accept third-party algorithms so you would be able to choose, or even buy maybe, there would be even a market for algorithm writers. Uh, so you would be able to choose what kind of algorithms you want to, you want on your Twitter or Facebook news feeds or even for your fridge, you know, when um, it automatically connects to a shop and orders for you the stuff that you're running out of. These kinds of stuff. Um, and then on a higher level, which I think is the most effective one, is, um, is a political level. And I think because of the power that they exert on everybody's lives, these algorithms, they should be regulated. Definitely they should be regulated by governments. Otherwise, um, basically governments become pointless and meaningless because that's one of the biggest functions to regulate um, when to regulate the power of private entities and this is completely being forgotten now that everybody is everything is becoming algorithm driven and I'm very happy to say that a few months ago I, I, I saw that Angela Merkel had said this she said that algorithms are exerting too much power on individuals lives and they, ha they have to be regulated uh, would you agree with that? No. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. I, I'm not sure I would agree. Just, uh, just a second, just to finish the answer. I'm not a fan of government regulation in general. I'm not. Uh, I don't think we need more things to be 
regulated by government. Uh, I think in general that leads to sort of entrenched interests, uh, monopolies, oligopolies, um, and bad service. <coughs> so I would much rather, I, I'm not saying the government shouldn't have a role in, say, encouraging an open marketplace, uh, say, in, in requiring certain standards. So regulatory of some kind. That's but, um, what I mean. That's what yeah, I mean. Okay. Yeah. Minimum, I, minimum regulation. Then I can agree. And certainly, Dave, I, I would agree if there were more if there were more open choices, would people would people choose to do that? If there were if you could ex, if you could say, look, there's you can achieve all the things you achieve on Facebook, but you're in control and the whole process is open and federated. If there were that option, would lots of people choose that? I, I would like to think they would. Um, certainly we could maybe exert more force on Facebook to provide more choice, to have multiple ways of looking at your feed instead of just one. Um, I'd certainly go along with that. Yeah, uh, question. In, in Germany we just had this, um, this draft of a new law that wants to regulate hate speech on, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And um, it's still not clear how it will end up, but the draft didn't look that promising. There are a lot of problematic passages in that. Yeah. But I don't understand why we have so little conversations as journalists about this because at the end of the day this is such a crucial point and I think the argument that um, it's dangerous to get the government involved is sort of obsolete because the government is involved. Like I mean Agreed. Facebook is Agreed. so crucial that it's Agreed. government is part of Facebook and it will be. Um, so I just read this uh, uh, parallel that uh, Facebook or the whole election debacle is, can be compared with the financial crisis and is that there is a crucial system, crucial for society, but it's totally opaque, no one understands it. And um, yeah, that, that's, for me, it's a little bit puzzling why we don't have that conversation, but, why people are demanding that. They're like, But look at what happened in the financial services. There was a regulatory agency, the government was involved, and they actually accelerated it and it made it worse. But as journalists, I mean, we failed in, uh, in the, in the, uh, the pre-run of the uh, financial crisis, and Agreed. I think we fail now as well, because we always uh, discuss this conversation on a, on a very broad, uh, ideologically laden uh, basis, but as journalists, we simply lack the expertise to report on that in a meaningful way. Uh, and one of the reasons, of course, goes back to funding, because a lot of the people who would be qualified enough to actually have a qualified opinion on, uh, uh, on, on algorithms they would never work for a journalist's uh, salary. Um, <laughs> how do Fair we, enough. How, how do Even journalists wouldn't work for journalist salaries, you know, yeah. so most of the time, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it would be interesting in your opinion, but what, what do you think we should do in this situation? Which situation? That we don't really report on algorithms in a qualified way, how we should regulate it. I think we need to do more I mean, that's part of what I was trying to describe in terms of transparency and awareness. I think we need more, we need more discussion, Panels. more openness, more transparency, more education. Um, I think a lot of the, even if we were to have conversations about this, a lot of people would just tune out because I don't think they understand the, how it affects them. So I think we need more discussion of that. And we also need to check, if I may add, the intervention of uh, gov government regulations. I, I'm, you know, I'm more, I'm more um, agnostic about it. I think there are w more solutions to different uh, and different situations. You know, but we need to be careful about these kind of laws that are being proposed because most of the times they don't actually solve any problems. No. They just add layers of complications. They, they, they add to censorship. They add to right. you know limitations. So this is another issue for journalists, I guess. I we think government regulation careful. of speech of any kind is a bad idea. Yeah. Period. That's, that's for sure. Question like that? Hello. John Hi. Crowley here from the International Hi, Business John. Times. Hi, Matthew. Um, I think most journalists would uh, agree that government regulation is a bad thing, but has the horse bolted so far that there isn't any other recourse? You know, do, are we all really convinced that if we go to Facebook, we go to the platform and say, hey, let's put pressure on you, please, can you open up your algo to us, that they're going to go, hey, sure. I mean, is this the last recourse of action where governments get involved? I'm afraid uh, it could be. Uh, I'm just leery of rushing in. Uh, well, there's nothing we can do, so we better get the government involved. Um, you know, the worst words you can hear are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. 
Uh, so, <laughs> because it inevitably leads to chaos and disaster. Uh, so, do we, I think I definitely think I think we're in agreement that the government needs to have a role. I just would like it not to be they decide, you know, what speech is appropriate, or they decide which algorithms are useful, or they decide which social platforms should exist and which shouldn't. Jump in. We're fully capable of screwing things up without think, the government. So I think, I mean, I, I don't think anyone would have any problem with the idea of government, governments or legislators uh, to force companies at least to disclose some information about the algorithms. This right. is one kind of intervention. It's mm -hmm. not regulating speech. It's regulating operations. It's regulating Disclosure, structures. Yeah. I agree. So if it's about structures and formulas, I don't think there is any problem. It's, it's already happening in many fields. Um, look at alcohol, cigarettes, health, anything that is related to health. Uh, driving, traffic. There is so much regulations about these things and nobody is complaining about them. But when it comes to technology, when it comes to Silicon Valley, suddenly regulation becomes a taboo word and people are suddenly are scared of it. And perhaps there's a requirement, perhaps there's a requirement that if you have a large social platform or a large search engine, you, it's incumbent on you to provide certain things. Maybe not all the details of the algorithm, but maybe uh, open interfaces in a certain way, maybe allowing, uh, uh, you know, infrastructure and sort of inter-networking, maybe, because Facebook basically allows zero. Um, if you write a plug-in or something that screws with the feed, they will nuke you from orbit. So uh, maybe if there were a few more requirements <laughs> that allowed you to do stuff like that, I'd certainly be in favor of yeah, that. Yeah, maybe serendipity requirements, you know. Why not? That would be a tough one. Yeah. How do you engineer serendipity? Yeah, well, when you, f when you know the ideological stance of somebody, you can take the opposite and insert it into newsfeed. I you know can. it's anti-economic for them, well, but it's, it's good for democracy, you know. Is it, I, Adam, I don't, I don't want to agree yeah. a lot with Facebook, but Adam Masseri made a good point, which is if you simply present the opposite view to someone, yeah. it actually makes them more entrenched in their existing view. It doesn't yeah. force them out of there. It's, it's, yeah. It that, has to be more subtle than that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's also would be my, my, my next point. You know, is we maybe need more science on these issues before, definitely, just, definitely. Be, before jumping into regulations. Because, for example, filter bubbles are, are being hotly debated. And the, the effects are, you know, if you take Facebook studies, it's not a problem at all. If you take some other studies, it's a huge problem that is killing democracy. No, we, I mean, we need programmers, wow. but also sociologists, psychologists. Yeah. You know, economists. everybody needs to be involved. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, next question. Um, I think I'm with Matthew on uh, yes. not having the government <laughs> intervene, but I agree with you that there is some role. But. The thing that scares me, and I live in America, so that is the perspective I come from. We talk a lot about news literacy. I find our legislators understand least mm. about these things. We literally have politicians who run with great pride that, oh, I've never been on email, or it, it, it's, it's nuts to me, you know, and the idea that they can't understand when, you know, Anthony Weiner's um, computer was found. Oh, how can they check, you know, 200,000 documents in nine days? It was like, well, they can do it in three minutes. But <laughs> so, I mean, what are your thoughts on actually educating our politicians and the people who I'm in make, favor of it. Well, yeah. the people who make decisions because technology and legislation are so far apart. You know, it is illegal for anyone to open my mail, my mail that comes from the postman. There are no such restrictions on um, information that is distributed technologically. It has implications for the Fourth Amendment. And I feel that one thing we are missing in our conversation about you know, the democracy that we live in and what we all need to learn, and so much is talked about how we as citizens have to learn, what is the obligation of our politicians to learn and understand this world of big data that we live in. Um, maybe it's okay in other countries, but in the U.S. it certainly isn't. I think that's a huge problem. I mean, you can't have the people who are making the laws not understand the things that they're dealing with. I mean, you certainly wouldn't let somebody make laws about cars who didn't understand how driving functions or who had never seen an internal combustion engine. Uh, you know, there has to be a certain level of knowledge. I don't, un I don't know how you require that. 
I certainly think we could expect that of the people that we vote for. Um, there's, a, there's a huge sort of knowledge gap, knowledge bankruptcy when it comes to that sort of thing. And yet they're the ones that are making the laws that are controlling the, the outcome. Um, I think if we can force them to learn those things, we certainly should. Yeah, but I think that would disappear in, in one generation. That wouldn't be an issue in 10 years because the younger people who are brought up by on, on these technologies would become the legislators. I, I think it might be a little longer than 10 years with our system. Um, but look at the warp speed with the which American things are changing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, <laughs> things change so fast. Goodness knows what's going to happen in yeah. that time. I don't um, think we can afford to wait either. Right, so that's the, that's the conundrum, you know. What, what is our role in helping people understand not just the consumers of our journalism, but the consumers of our journalism on Capitol Hill as well? We need Hill to well. elect more teenagers. <laughs> yeah, my point is we need to better translate the scientific knowledge that we already have into everyday knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. things that people need to, can learn and actually understand. We, can, we cannot give them, you know, the full studies. We, we can also give them, of course, because the Internet is powerful and as long as JSTOR doesn't oppose, you know, and public knowledge is actually public, you know, as it should be, you know, and we, we can have an informed opinion about that. But, but that's but something journalists can do. I mean, yeah. our job is to make yeah. things understandable. Yeah, we, we could we, probably do a better job. Of yeah, that. we could probably have like proper, you know, institution or an organization, media organizations that are actually translating scientific knowledge into everyday knowledge. That, that's my point. That will help, I guess. Maybe remedial classes for politicians, you know, where they go and study how computers yeah. work. Yeah, that workshops. Earning their pay, you know. <laughs> Why not? I first wanted to say that I'm so happy for this panel because I think we really missed that perspective on the whole thing. We're talking on fake news all the time and Trump and I don't know what and all the things already happening online, happening on the algorithms, happen on Facebook and Google, um, but not on the meter level, not on the structure. And I wanted to highlight this is probably not about governmental control, but it is about political guarantees for free traffic of information. And this is not so transparency, guaranteed transparency. And definitely this is something journalists should fight for. And um, this is something we have to force the big algorithms to do because there is not an alternative to it. Um, because uh, I perfectly understand that there is always a kind of a bad feeling when it's about <coughs> governmental control. But now we are um, running into monopolies that we just don't look into. And of course, in the beginning you said we have the possibility to kind of impact, influence what kind of information is taken from us, but we don't have any possibility possibility to control or to impact what information is given to us. And I think we have to crash that situation, definitely. Totally agree. Mm. Definitely. More Dave? Questions? Oh, Dave, you said you were done. <laughs> you said you only had... It's my turn. Go ahead. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. The, we, we got one here. Go ahead. This is important. Yes. Yes. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> this is very important. So I need so to, coming. to speak in English. Uh, so I want to thank you, all of you, especially Fabio Chiusi, because before meeting you, I didn't know anything about Tigerines and so on, you know. I don't have Facebook, I don't have anything. But before meeting you, I didn't know anything about love. Uh. And now it's been one year and a half, and I feel so honored, blessed, grateful to be your woman and <laughs> to stay with you. And I really want to say that I love you. And oh boy. because I'm so proud of you uh, and of us, we are maybe a, a way to fight against big data and so on is love, I think. <laughs> love oh, yeah. is revolution. So maybe you're, are you free on the 29th of August in Sarajevo to I, I, marry I'm, me? I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> I actually am. Is 29 is okay? <laughs> what? 
It's 29? Yeah, yeah definitely, yes. definitely. Okay, we have a day. Yes. <laughs> we have a day. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Mary. This is not an egg, okay. This is me. Oh, boy. <laughs> I know, this is beautiful. <laughs> This is okay. this, this is the most interesting panel I've ever been on. <laughs> I don't think that's ever happened before. This is definitely a way to get day one in a good mood, you know. But a, marriage, <laughs> anyway. a marriage proposal. <laughs> you got to top that. You got to top oh, that. <laughs> yeah, I have to kiss them. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> August. No. Actually, actually, no. <laughs> it's going to be right here. It's going to be the roof on it. No, no. Oh, no, no. Sarajevo, okay. I really wonder how you go on. Yeah, but I, don't, I don't know what we can. Please, questions I from the public. I hope it wasn't fake news. <laughs> no, no. It no could fake be. News. You never know. <laughs> no That's fake news. That's how it's connected back to the. No to fake the news, but yeah, questions, please. <laughs> Dave, Dave, did you still have a question? No. no. We. we Anyone? We killed the panel. Okay, <laughs> you don't. Yeah, you don't have to top that. Just, but questions are okay. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> we still have uh, ten minutes, so <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Hi, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm from the Jordan Media Institute, and I've attended a few sessions since. Um, yesterday and um, mm -hmm. we've heard a lot about journalists complaining and then criticizing themselves and then um, complaining again <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but we haven't heard <coughs> solutions to many of the issues raised during many of the sessions hmm. so um, one of the I mean the issues you raised I it's either I'm slow or I, I, I didn't get to, I, I need to go back home with some answers. And how can we deal with all this? I'm involved in a media in an information literacy project in Jordan. And so we see a lot, I mean, we're trying to deal with all this data and how people can analyze the information and how to do it ethically and uh, uh, especially on social media and how to do privacy settings, how to be careful because we, we work with school children. Yeah. And so... Um, I think you're already doing it. I mean, I certainly couldn't so recommend... Is it, is it just about awareness? Should we just... Because we can't stop the flow. I think it we starts with awareness. It starts with it awareness. It has to start with awareness. So literacy, yeah. information literacy, social media literacy, yes. and certainly with children... Uh, it's not just politicians. Uh, I've seen some frightening studies uh, of high school students who did not know, could not recognize what was happening. This was in the form of fake news. They couldn't distinguish between an advertisement and a non-advertisement. They couldn't distinguish between a fake news article and a real news article. Or a story and an opinion. And a or a story and an opinion. Yeah. And so those types of things... The, the problems those can cause, I think, are, are, are huge, and yet it's a relatively uh, easy solution to try. It's education, and I think we educate kids about so many things. It, it shouldn't be that hard to get them to notice that on an ad it says sponsored in, in large type. Um, that's, yeah. you know, it's not rocket surgery. That should be relatively easily easy to figure out. I think it has to be, it has to start small and then build. So education is the first building block and then you raise awareness and then some people want to take action or become involved and you, and you know, a movement builds, that's how. But I certainly, I can't think of anything you should do that you're not doing. We need the media as well. Yes, yeah. definitely. And that's part of the education process. Yeah, I think I think too. You know, it, when we speak of government uh, education, and we definitely need med media education on technology. Imagine reporting on cyber attacks. You know, it's very tough. You have attribution problem. It's tough for tech for technicians. It's very tough for media now to become you know propagandists of some kind of views. So what it's I what not I, just that I think media we do tend, and I fall into this trap too. Yeah. If you especially if you're writing about technology and you tend to 
use the jargon that the industry uses. Exactly. And this happens all the time. It happens in government. It happens in other industries. You fall into that because that's, that's what the people you're reporting on, that's how they talk. But that's not helpful to people who aren't already part of that. Uh, it, and it pushes them away. And I think you, we have to force ourselves, editors are a good way of doing this, force ourselves to stop using the shorthand and the jargon and the, and the sort of code words because those things exclude people. Yeah, and we definitely need to know more about crypto, you know, more about the technical stuff too, in order to really understand. Because m most of, you know, of the profiling that has been done on every, on each of us has to do with us being visible to them. You know, if we manage to be less visible to them, you know, maybe their, again, their profiling can be worse, you know. So it, it doesn't solve everything. But for example, when you talk mass surveillance, if, if crypto scales, it becomes much more difficult and, and less economical for them. You know, in economic terms, it's, it's much, uh, much less convenient for them to actually try and surveil everybody because it takes a lot of more effort. They can still maybe target someone if they really want to, and maybe crypto is not enough, but you know, still knowing how to check whether there is some kind of interference in your communication, you know. And that's especially for journalists, you know, that, that I think, and for me too, I would love to attend such class, you know. I would definitely love to, and I don't know why we could we couldn't like really mandate it for everyone for everyone. It's we're all dealing with technology, you know. We we should know what we're dealing with, you know. <laughs> yeah, I would love to know more about tech, this kind of technical side of the issue, you know. Definitely. Uh, there's some other questions. I just want to add something. Sure. There is also this danger. I mean, now that you see that you, you see the collapse of public education system around the world, the collapse of welfare states, the privatization of education, and when you see this and you put this next to these huge empires of cash that are coming from technology, I mean, Google, Facebook, they are becoming really huge empires, and they are the ones who are probably going to fund many of of private um, um, education institutions, or at least to contribute to them. So then how would you expect this privatized education system to work against the interests of its, its sponsors? So that's another case, again, for uh, against the neoliberal realities of, of our world now, especially in North America and in many other parts of the world, unfortunately. I think we could encourage people as well. Like, I think people, even if they think about this stuff, they think well, Facebook is a $500 billion organization. Uh, what, what could I possibly do? You know, and I think there's lots of things that people could do. They could make their voices heard. They could ask for change. They could pressure a company. I mean, companies are vulnerable to, to customer um, mm. complaints. They're vulnerable to boycotts. Uh, those types yeah. of things raise awareness. I think there's lots of things people could do, even if they're not programmers. Yeah, pressure groups, specific pressure groups about these topics, lobbies who focus on these things, they could have an effect, but I'm not sure how much. Yeah, promise to. And it should be through legislation, otherwise it wouldn't be effective. Yeah, they should be powerful enough. That's the problem. Yeah. You know, Google, Facebook, and these big giants have powerful lobbies. You know, they're powerful interests. So it's tough to oppose. You know, sometimes. Sometimes they, 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 they do good things, you know. They oppose, for yeah. example, I was in Brussels at RightsCon last week, and they all were talking about internet shutdowns, you know, and, they, mm -hmm. and, and Facebook, Google, and they, they play a huge part of it because, of course, it's in their interest. But again, it's in everybody's interest, you know, that internet get, doesn't get shut down. It uh, doesn't get shut. But again, shut down doesn't mean anything here, you know, most of the time. So it's another catchphrase. But again, it's a good thing. The problem is when you have, like, powerful interests that work against the public interest, you know, and that's, that's really much tougher to, to oppose. You can also find uh, support, I think, or at least help in unusual places sometimes. So in the U.S., uh, laws were effectively repealed that, that would have forced uh, ISPs to not release personal information to sell it to advertisers mm. and so on. Um, and when this was reported... 
uh, lots of conservative supporters of Trump and you would assume supporters of his laws said, wait, what? They're doing what? And they, they said that this was not what they had in mind. Uh, you can often find, by explaining what's happening in simple terms, people who just weren't aware that that was even a problem um, could become a supporter, could become a critic of the, whatever the government's trying to do. Yeah. Last question. Uh, just a quick question. Have you tried to get someone from Facebook to join us here to discuss this? Someone from Facebook to... From Facebook with these big players here. Oh, I, I, I think they're missing in this dialogue. Oh, okay. I agree. It would be personally. great to hear from yeah. them. Oh, definitely. If there is someone from Facebook here, can please... <laughs> <laughs> they, <laughs> they wouldn't. I, I'm happy, I'd be okay. happy to hear from them. You know, I, I think I know where to find them. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't know. Drag one. But of course, it's not just Facebook, you know, it's a lot of companies. They're busy controlling what you see and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but they just don't have time. Yeah. Okay, I'd so say if there is one last question or no? We're all uh, going to see things about marriages this today <laughs> yeah. in our news feeds. <laughs> okay, so thanks. The, the marriage panel. <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you for coming. Yeah. <laughs> the next session we're solving all the problems that we just nice. where is the next session right here so stay right here if you want solutions is anyone going to get married in your session no algorithms <laughs> human rights compliance and uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, we know a lot of about fake news and things like that, you know, even another catchphrase that I personally hate. But um, again, this is very a very real problem. Algorithms can go against democracy, against media pluralism, against the th truth or some so-called truth. Algorithms are not transparent. Most of the times we don't know what, why we see what we see on Facebook, why what we see what we see on Google. You know, we, we, we lack precise criteria. We don't really know what's going on there, and that's a problem too. And then, and we can go on forever, but I want to pass on to my uh, co-panelists. And uh, another problem is that we have algorithms against spam, for example, that become algorithms against extremism, and again, they become censorship. So you, you, need, you, start, you start out with something that should be uh, completely straightforward. You don't want spam to, you know, bother you all the time on the internet, and instead you end up with systems of filter filtering systems. Okay, I have some notes. Okay, and you'll... <laughs> okay, fantastic. Okay. <clears throat> Shall we start? Sure. Yeah. Okay, we're starting, so uh, we have five minutes late, so we're starting right now. Um, let me just briefly introduce the panel. I'm Fabio Chiusi, I'm a journalist for L'Espresso and a fellow of the Nexus Center in Turin. And um, with me is Hossein Direction, a Canadian Iranian uh, blogger and author, and Matthew Ingram for um, Fortune magazine. Uh, and it's quite a good company. <laughs> and um, the panel is How to Fight Back Against Big Data. And I don't particularly like the, the, the catchphrase big data, you know, because it, it obscures more than it tells and it reveals. And I think <clears throat> we should, in technology, get rid of such, you know, marketing, PR-oriented words. I prefer talking about automatic filtering systems for uh, having to do with extremism, propaganda, and that ultimately lead to censorship, which is a kind of a huge problem. Uh, like some days ago, Twitter said, that more, more than 250,000 accounts have been suspended by algorithms and filters built to find spam, but employed to combat the specter of violent extremism. This is a serious issue, you know, not just because of what of the propaganda we're exposed to, but uh, also uh, for the things that we lose when we censor some kind of contents. So we lack basically everything when we deal with this issue, even, when, even if we start to talk about it quite extensively. And my first question to the panel is, uh, 
is it possible at all to fight back against all of this? Because algorithms are so pervasive and so everywhere in our lives. They even, you know, drive market transactions. They do everything. They're, start, they're about to start uh, driving cars themselves. Everything is, uh, they start to be delivering uh, fruit and vegetables via, via drones. You know, it's going to be crazy. And, and it, we have algorithms that claim to be objective, but in fact they're not. And again, they hide some political discourse or maybe ideological discourse or motivations that are the ones of those who created the algorithms, which right now, most of the times, are still human beings <laughs> and not other algorithms, even if it's possible. And algorithms also uh, essentially have no ethics, whereas, in fact, again, they embody and they enshrine the ethics of their creators, and we totally lack, uh, uh, um, or almost totally lack, a discussion on the ethics of algorithms, and this has bad consequences as well. Some algorithms are even non-human rights compliant, and uh, I can remember Michael Hayden, uh, General Michael Hayden, uh, former director of the CIA at the NSA, say we kill ba people based on metadata. And these metadata most of the times are, are computed by algorithms. So these are very, very uh, important consequences for human beings. And of course, one of the questions I would like to, to, to put out here is how to make uh, algorithms, which is instead a quite technical and uh, precise uh, term, a set of instructions to do something, you know, in a finite uh, number of passages. Uh, the problem is that when you have a lot of data, of course, nobody would say having more data is bad. Uh, instead, when you're talking of algorithms and the influence you have in, in the lives of people, there are some quite bad consequences of having life driven by algorithms, and that's what we're about to talk. Just a brief uh, talk about, brief, uh, brief introduction on, on the issue for those who are not uh, into this topic. Uh, algorithms have, have uh, given way to a lot of uh, bad uh, instances and of behavior. For example, we have automatic decisions that lead to automatic discriminations, which is a growing field of research. And we have a lot of uh, bad consequences in biases in data sets, for example, in code, which are enshrined in code. In, uh, in e rating systems that influence the way in which you're judged, in which you get credit, for example, in your insurance rates and everything.